This is an introduction to Focus Sign Beam, and I and Roberto Garcia will be making the presentation. We work with the Analytical Instrumentation Facility at NC State, and we have our emails there. And if you would like a copy of the slides, send us a note and we will be happy to do that. Why would you want to use an FIB? This instrument has site-specific material removal, 10 nanometers resolution, but you may or may not be aware you can also deposit material with on the order of 100 nanometers resolution. You also have an instrument which provides channeling contrast that enables you to provide information on materials directly with this instrument. The other approach that is often used is for FIB to prepare samples for other techniques. As an example, here is a channeling contrast for copper. And it's different from what you see with an SEM. <clears throat> you can often get very high contrast and see the grains directly displayed. In terms of sample preparation, our facility does an awful lot of the, uh, let's switch this to the laser, an awful lot of the TEM preparation. And this means that in a sample, we can actually cut away, attach a needle and remove a slight, uh, very thin section of material without destroying the rest of the sample. That's an immensely valuable technique. The outline for today is instrument configuration, especially the liquid metal ion source, description of the interaction of the ions with the substrate, and deposition and enhanced stetch. What's in an FIV? You need a vacuum system. Those ions don't go very far in air. We need an ion column. With this source, we'll discuss in a little bit. Optics, steering, deflection. Need a stage, move the sample. Something to collect the secondary electrons or ions. The gas injection systems are used for deposition and etch. Of course, we need a computer. And our particular instrument has a number of options. Many FIVs have additional options. Most of the FIVs sold now have an SEM added. This really makes the instrument much more capable. An instrument called a micromanipulator to lift out samples. You may have EDS and EBSD capabilities as well. Here's a schematic and we'll particularly mention our instrument, but many instruments are very similar. You have an electron column here for the SEM. And at a specific angle, in our case, 52 degrees, you have a gallium source, which is your ion source. Why the 52 degrees? This enables you to be cutting the sample and then without moving the sample, take an electron, secondary electron image with the SEM. That's a very great capability. You also have lift out needle, gas nozzle, electron deflector detector, if you put your head in the system, and we don't advise you to do that, and looked up, you would actually see all of these things we just described. Here's your electron column, your ion column, your gas injection needles, your lift out needle, detector. You can see they're all aimed at one point, and this would be your eucentric point. So once you've aligned this, you can add your uh, disposal, you have all of these capabilities to operate on the sample. The liquid metal ion source, it's a very interesting source. It's a field emission based ion source that produces ions from the liquid phase rather than the gas phase. It's a liquid metal supported by a tungsten needle. <clears throat> And we're going to show several pictures of it, but here's an example of one. You can see it's not much bigger than, it's smaller than a, a, an American dime. And here's your needle and the electrodes. 
The ions are emitted from a liquid at the end of the needle when you apply a high voltage. Gallium is the most common liquid metal ion source. It has properties that are very suitable for what we want to do. You, the gallium is pretty much a liquid at room temperature. It can be made a fairly long life, 1500 hour source. And the gallium is high enough in, in uh, weight in atomic number to sputter easily. So let's uh, look at another one of these. And uh, Roberto, I'm not sure we can easily show one. So let's skip that part of it. it uh, um, but if you look at one under higher magnification, here, this is one partially used. You can see the gallium in here. This is only about a millimeter and only, you know, a few millimeters long. That gallium then wets the surface of this needle. The reason that you get ions is that you have an extremely high electric field, 10 to the eighth volts per centimeter. So your gallium is wetting this needle. The atoms evaporate from the liquid surface and are ionized. There's a flow of gallium, so as the ions are emitted, the gallium continues to wet and flow. This pressure uh, due to the flow causes the cone to elongate. And what you get is a cone with a jet at its apex. Here's a TEM image of an operating liquid metal ion source. Here would be your underlying tungsten, and the gallium would wet the surface of that, and you see it being pulled out. This is what enables you to obtain this very highly focused ion beam. They didn't always look that nice. Here's one of the more original styles, but over time they've been developed into something which is uh, quite small, and the 1500 hours is a fairly long lifetime. Here is our high-tech display showing what's involved with a focus ion beam column. You're going to have the liquid metal ion source, a suppressor and extractor, two lenses, just the same as you would have for an SEM, but they're electrostatic and not electromagnetic. Something to focus the beam, sigmators, something to move the beam, a deflector, and something we'll talk about a little bit more. You have control over how that beam is moved on the sample. That's really important. You can change the dwell and the spacing to match some of the things that you see on your sample. To give you an idea of how this voltages are uh, set up on the instrument, your acceleration voltage is typically for us around 30,000 volts. Your extractor might be around 10 kV and your other lens is something a little less than 30 kV. You will notice also that, that if you look at the instrument, here's your 52 degrees, here's your electron column, here's your ion column. You'll notice it's pretty small. The ion column itself is no longer than about a pencil. And the reason is the ions tend to repel each other by Coulomb repulsion. And if you make the beam path longer, the beam actually gets to be broader. Many of these instruments can go to a higher voltage. We found we really don't have to go beyond 30,000 volts. 50,000 volts, uh, uh, increases your risk of some sort of discharge. And I think you really need to do it. And again, here's your orientation. Here's your sample chamber. And you'll see other things attached here. This is the micromanipulator. What happens when the ion hits the substrate? So our primary ion comes in. We remove material. Most of it would be neutrals. You also get some secondary ions, positive and negative. 
you'll get quite a few electrons. You also get some x-rays. The x-rays are not sufficient to really make use of. The secondary electrons we use to see the sample, so they're detected with secondary electron detector. The neutrals are what is removed. This is an important slide. If you understand this, then you understand everything going on with sputtering. Your primary ion comes in, hits the surface, loses its charge, loses its energy through a set of collisions. This collision cascade removes the energy from the primary ion and the ion is implanted. So you actually, when you hit the surface with a gallium beam, you're implanting gallium into the material. Some of the collision cascade puts enough energy to your secondary species to remove them as neutrals or ions. Even though this may be 30 kV, these come off at very low energy. And we'll show a diagram on that, but something less than 10 eV. You have a certain escape depth, so you can see from this, the sputtered species are really very close to the surface. And you have a certain, if you do ion implantation at all, that's the projected range, the typical implant depth for your primary species. So once again, the primary ion hits the surface, loses energy in a collision cascade, and is implanted. Some of the energy is given to atoms near the surface, and they are removed. If you look at a comparison between ions and electrons, our typical one is a gallium ion versus an electron. The size, the mass is much different. That difference in mass is about the same as a BB in a 88 millimeter shell, to give you a comparison. The ions don't penetrate very far. The electrons penetrate much further. You get a lot of secondary electrons, no backscatter. We can get some secondary ions and very little x-rays. So the ions are heavier, slower, penetrate less than electrons, but they do more damage. There are simulation programs out there and you can typically get these for free. For ions, that's called TRIM, Transport of Ions and Matter. And we'll show you the web link for that shortly. Comparing them, here's this red region here. Now look at the electrons under Casino. You can see are broader and much deeper at the same energy into this iron substrate. I really suggest that you download the trim. It's under www.srim.org. It simulates penetration of anything into anything. So any so in this case, we're simulating gallium, which you would use into silicon. And you can see from this, our ion range is about 27 nanometers, and this would be sigma. So our penetration depth is about 36 nanometers for 30 keV gallium. When you look at the secondary ions, secondary uh, particles that come off, this is for 900 EV argons. This is an older paper. Uh, Oakshner is one of the people that did a lot of work early on on sputtering. But the peak of the sputtered species is less than 5 EV. These are the simulations you can do with that trim software. And this is important to understand because this helps you understand, look at what's going on at the surface, where the collisions are, and the angle of incidence. If you look at the left side, this is normal incidence. You see the collision cascade. Very few interactions at the surface, most of them deeper. Now let's do the same thing at 70 degrees from normal. Here's your ion beam coming in, and now we're not penetrating very far. We have many more collisions near the surface. If you look at this, you would say, aha, I think the one on the right is gonna sputter faster, and that would be correct. If you do those simulations over 
a range of angles of incidence, you'll see that the peak of the sputtering yield, which is how many atoms came off for the number of ions you put in, that peaks around 75 eV. You can see it's the same for a number of different elements. In this case, zinc sputters faster than silicon and the others are somewhere in between. Now, this is important to understand. If I sputter at normal incidence, <coughs> but I sputter at an edge, look at what happens. I have many more collisions near the edge. And because of that, if I sputter an edge, I sputter much faster than I do at the surface, usually at least three times faster. Therefore, in working with an FIB, we pretty much always want to go and sputter at an edge if we can. Because we're sputtering an edge, we're not going to penetrate as deeply into the material. At the surface, we will, and this will come up more in the applications, but if I'm going to look right at the surface of a material, if I'm sputtering from above, I'm going to damage that by that 36 nanometers if it's silicon and I need to put a protective layer on to absorb that. Here you can see how deep you would go if you are sputtering and going directly into the surface of your material. Ishitani in this reference, if you're working with, uh, if you're trying to look up people, he is the person that did most of the publications for Hitachi. Now let's look at sputtering yield versus the periodic table. Notice there are peaks. This is not constant at all. There's a tremendous variation for certain elements versus others in terms of sputter yield. I'll mention this book, uh, John Orlov, um, Udla, Lynn Swanson, High Resolution FIB. Uh, and at the very end, we'll show a few references. This is a good book if you want to learn more about the actual uh, uh, ion beams. So we have this variation over the periodic table and it doesn't matter the energy or the material we sputter with, they're going to be the same. So we're gonna show a couple of simulations to help you understand that. This, they're going to be SF5 plus on biphenyl molecules on silicon and on copper. So SF5 bombarding the silicon, do you see that it penetrates deeply into the material? And look at the spacing of the silicon atoms here. This is a simulation. These are done by Barbara Garrison at, Penn, at the Penn State University. She spent an entire career doing these simulations. And you can go to these and look at them on our website, which I've included. But if you look at this simulation, these are all the collisions from that one molecule SF5 plus sitting the sample and here's the biphenyl which we're trying to remove. Now let's go to copper and do the same thing. Do you notice the SF5 plus sitting the surface? Now look at the simulation here. We're seeing significant amounts of the biphenyl removed, the SF5 did not penetrate very far. The collisions are much closer to the surface. This would tell you, you would expect copper to, to sputter faster than the silicon. And if we now look at the same dose given to different samples, silicon, aluminum, copper, zinc, we see that the zinc sputters quite a bit faster than the silicon. Silicon is great to work with because it gives you a nice flat bottom when you're sputtering it. Copper often sputters very unevenly. But this helps to try and explain why in the periodic table you have different sputtering rates for different materials. And I think a lot of that is simply due to the structure of the material. When you are sputtering with the FIB, you have the chance to 
use different ways to remove the material. This is what's called a stair step trench. So here's what we want to expose. Here's something put on top to protect it. And we have hit this with a removal procedure, which is different from the one on the right. In the one on the right, we're using what's called a cleanup cut. And in this, do you see all this material? If you look at this little line back here, the dark and the lighter area, all of this is re-sputtered material. This is material that came up from the front and was uh, sputter deposited back here. The difference between the two is that with the regular cross section, we're continuing to remove this material at each point all the way through. With the cleaning cross section, we're just going through in one direction and we're leaving a lot of material here. Obviously, we don't want all this redeposition. So this is something to be aware of in doing your experiment. Let's look at the deposition and enhanced stitch processes. I said that we can deposit material. How does that work? We have the ion beam on the surface, but if we bring a gas injection nozzle very close to the surface and put a sticky material in it, such as a metal organic, it sticks to the surface, the ion beam breaks it down, and then the continue, material continues to be stuck onto the surface and continues to be broken down. This is called ion beam assisted chemical vapor deposition. I'll mention this article here. This is a great review article. John Mengelis has done an awful lot of the work on deposition and etch. Now, if I want to remove material more rapidly, I can bring in a gas injection nozzle, but instead of a sticky material, I'm going to put in a reactive material. As I sputter these molecules away, instead of them being redeposited somewhere, the reactive gas attacks them, makes them volatile, and they're pumped away. This is deposition, and this is what we'll call enhanced stetch. How close is the needle? Uh, currently in our system, we're about 500 micrometers away. Some of the ones I worked with are only like 100 micrometers. Currently, we're using methyl cyclopentadienyl trimethyl platinum. Some people use tungsten, and this is the metal organic which breaks down to leave something that is mostly platinum. It will also have a lot of carbon in it. This figure shows you the relationship between the area that you want of interest here. I think we can go back to the laser pointer. And it shows the deposition needle. Deposition needle is only 500 micrometers across so it's half a millimeter. You can see how close it is to the surface. Also shown here in the correct relationship is the lift out micromanipulator needle. The gas is delivered to the sample very close to the surface. We either get enhanced removal or deposition. And now we're gonna talk about some of the parameters for deposition. All right, so the, the beam has the ability to be controlled. We can control the dwell time, how long it stays in one spot, the overlap, how much one beam spot overlaps the next, and how quickly we get back to the same spot. The gas parameters, pressure, flux, sticking coefficient, the sticking coefficient depends on the choice of your gas. The flux and the pressure are something which are pretty much set up by the instrument manufacturer. You don't have to worry as much about this, but you really have control over these. And that turns out to be maybe more important than you realize. If you look at the dwell time and overlap, for example, here would be zero overlap. And here would be 50% overlap. 
you can imagine the beam current density is much higher here than it is here. The spacing can also be changed, so you can make this quite a bit more open or not. And the refresh time, so an example, 10 micrometers, 100 nanometer beam, 200 steps with 50% overlap. It's a digital, you have to think digitally here. So we're putting the beam down, digitally moving at a certain distance again and again, and here moving it, but overlapping it more. Therefore, we have spacing, overlap. The overlap on our instrument, the maximum is minus 100%. People have used even up to 200, 300% because they want to deposit with a very large pattern. And if they make these too close, then they wind up getting back to the same point too quickly and removing material rather than depositing. <clears throat> As far as what we're doing with the sputtering, this is a very instructive slide. In this case, do you see the beam direction here? We are going to sputter and try and set up a pattern where we have something in the middle and material removed around the side. If we go in only one direction here, we'll see we remove material and it's deeper at that end. Now let's take the same situation, but let's sputter moving from the middle to the outside. Now you see we are higher in the middle and we're much deeper at the edge. Let's take the same pattern but not sputter as much. This so it's a lighter sputtering. Now you see we've left a small nodule in the middle and this is fairly flat going out. Now let's take the same pattern and go in with some current from the outside. So you see now we have made a pillar in the middle. Therefore, by changing your scan direction, you can change quite a bit the pattern that you're going to see. Okay, Roberto, did you want to do this? Sure, sure, I'll take over here. Okay. So one of the things uh, that you're going to use uh, in the FIB and when you determine um, your material is a patterning application file. And basically, there's a lot of information in that file uh, about the beam size, beam parameters, uh, but you can change typically uh, three values in there. Uh, the dwell time and the overlap that you want, uh, you can change very quickly. The volume per dose you can change. It has been calculated. Uh, a lot of equipment comes with the pre-calculated uh, volume per dose, but a lot of people use different materials, uh, you know, different ceramics and stuff like that. Uh, you may not, uh, you may find that your ceramic removes very similar to uh, like sapphire or silicon, but if not, you can certainly de determine what that volume per dose is. Uh, next slide, Fred. So here's typical uh, volume per dose calculation for a patterning application file. Uh, so basically what you would do is just do a rectangular uh, uh, removal rectangular shape and using whatever beam you have just go ahead and run it for a while then use uh, AFM or some type of way to determine exactly what volume you removed <clears throat> and then you basically come up with uh, volume per dose so here's an example of uh, volume uh, if we're going to remove a 50 micrometer um, uh, cube uh, volume with a 0.5 nanoamp uh, beam uh, with a dose of 0.5 nanoamps. Basically, it's going to take about, you know, 667 uh, seconds. Now, if we double that volume, it's going to just basically double that time. Okay. Uh, another thing we can do is if for that same volume, for the 50, if we increase the dose or the beam current, uh, we can half the time. So a lot of times when you're doing FIB applications, you're basically, you know, fighting against time. You want to do things very quickly so that you're not doing it, uh, staying uh, on the fit for too long. So that's why a lot of times when you do uh, TEM preparation, you may start off with a very large beam just to remove material quickly, but then as you get closer and closer to the area of interest, you're gonna bring it down uh, to a very fine beam so that you don't damage your sample. Next. 
Okay, so this is the typical uh, XML uh, application file that we have in the FEI instrument. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of information on here. There's definitely a lot of uh, different parameters, but really the ones that uh, are concern uh, most people and actually uh, that they change very readily is the dwell time and the overlap and then the volume per dose. And that, that's gonna impact quite a bit. Uh, so this volume per dose, whatever is here, basically is gonna determine a lot of your removal rate. So like uh, Fred showed in the video, if we have silicon, uh, your volume per dose is going to be fairly uh, small compared to something like copper. Copper is gonna be much larger. So for the same type of volume removal, uh, it's gonna go much faster with the copper. Okay. And then this is the pattern application files that uh, come with the uh, instrument. So they basically pretty much have identified all these different uh, materials and they have this volume per dose. What I will say is it can vary. Uh, so I would recommend even you can, this is probably a good place to start, but if you're really gonna be doing a lot of work in a particular ceramic or uh, material, just go ahead and determine it yourself. Next slide. Okay. And then here is basically, um, this is in copper. So this is basically just changing the overlap. So you can see this is 50% overlap. So the beam is very tight on this one. Uh, you can see all this material on the uh, side here that's accumulating. That's actually redap. Uh, you go to 0%. You have a lot of redap. And then if you go to minus 50%, uh, you get a lot less redap. So by spacing out the beam a little bit more, you still get a lot of removal, uh, but you don't get a lot of that redep so that you don't have to remove that redep afterwards. Next. Okay. Then you want to take it over from here, Fred? Okay. And uh, Kai Wong, one of our graduate students, uh, was doing an awful lot of work in organics, and he was doing some simulations here to help you see the difference between minus 50 percent zero and 50 percent overlap this gives you an idea of the intensity differences as to what's hitting the sample this is an example why these parameters we've been mentioning are so important these are deposition parameters for tungsten so tungsten hexacarbonyl is another one of the metal organics that is used. On the one on the left, 15 microseconds dwell, 0.16 micrometer step size. We're going to change two parameters. Change the dwell to 0.3 microseconds and the step size to 0.6. Here, we didn't deposit, we removed material. Here, you can actually see the individual steps on this as the tungsten is deposited. I'll mention ISFA proceedings. If you're looking at papers, ISFA and the MAS uh, EMSA meetings are ones that typically have an awful lot of the papers for people doing work with focused sign beam. People have used these deposition capabilities to make all kinds of features. Matsui is famous for doing this. He's using styrene as a precursor. We do not have that on our instrument. But you can see you can make delicate three-dimensional items here. Um, he left out the toilet paper here. I guess we need that. And uh, here's in Osaka because he's uh, from Japan. You can also use the electron beam to make deposits. And if you look at that, deposition, the electron beam can allow you to make a finer deposition than you can with the ion beam. However, it will be a lot slower. The example on the right, these are actually needles sticking up here about 300 nanometers high. We often use the electron beam for deposition to protect the sample surface Otherwise, when we first start to deposit with the ion beam, you're damaging the surface below to that, no, oh, 35 nanometers or so. The electron beam does much less damage. 
We actually have another example here of the sputtering process gas assisted. Here's your gallium beam coming in, your incoming gas molecules reacting with the substrate and sputtering away. We use a water source to increase the removal mate rate of carbon-based material. It's actually something that was uh, just uh, discovered at NC State and patented by them. So the water source allows you to remove material that are organics. Here's a table which shows you for different materials what your removal rate enhancement would be. You see a number of these are fairly aggressive gases, chlorine, iodine, XCF2, and the water. For silicon, if I use chlorine, I'm going to remove an order of magnitude faster. That can be critical if I need to remove a lot of material. And for SiO2, I want to use XCF2. But notice that if I use the water, I don't enhance any of these other material, any of these, the removal rate of any of these other materials. And as an example, this was Terry Stark in 1995 when they came up with this. Here is a polyimid, which they have removed the polyimid, but exposed the aluminum because the polyimid removes much faster than it would uh, than the removal rate from the aluminum. You actually delineate these features, so you're not damaging those lines. We do have a problem at cryogenic temperatures because your water source uh, is just going to collect on the surface. But for organics, this is something worth considering. And this is one of the sources we have on our instrument. All right, your takeaway message here. Your closing notes, the FIB provides mature removal and deposition on the nanoscale. Understanding the ion sample interaction will improve your analysis. And hopefully you'll remember those slides and we'll be happy to send you a copy of this so that you understand what's going on at the sample. The knowledge of the dwell and overlap is also very important. We'll cover applications in the next presentation. And a note on some references. Here are a couple of books that are oriented uh, or edited or written by John Orlop, very uh, knowledgeable and involved with the development of the source. There's another book by Nanyal, and there's a book uh, by Lucille Giannuzzi and myself on introduction to focus ion beams. So once again, here are our, um, our email addresses at NC State. I'm now going to stop the share and see if we have any questions. I'll, I'll leave the share on. Let me know if there are any questions in case we want to go back to a slide. So uh, why does high overlap increase the deposition? I think we showed that in that one um, copper. Slide why does high overlap would reduce the deposition, not um, increase it? It actually increases it. Uh, in, in which me, one? If you, oh, uh, you, oh, you're talking about the redeposition, not the deposition with the gas source. Right, redeposition. Okay, do you want to take that? So if you go to slide 46 and 47, what's happening is with the higher overlap, you actually are removing a lot more material. So what that ends up doing is just uh, forming more redeposition. So what you're trying to do with the overlap with the material is you're trying to optimize it. You want to remove enough material to get the depth, but not get enough uh, or, or just minimize the amount of redeposition. And one of the things to note here, one size does not fit all. And okay. Roberto has done a lot of work with different materials and can show you that what where, where a minus 50% overlap works better to remove material for one material, no overlap or 50% overlap may work better for another. And I'll take you back to that sputter rate removal chart, which I believe is pretty much related to the makeup of the, of the atoms, how they're put together. And if you remember that silicon versus copper, this is something which I think is a big contributing factor. Yeah. We haven't worked all of these out. And if you have a new material, 
we can offer suggestions of a few different ways to try sputtering it. It can make a difference of more than a factor of two in your removal. Uh, for another question, FIB could be adaptable to work with other than gallium source? Yes, people have used a number of sources. Indium is frequently an option, but if you really want to remove material, what has come about are the new gas sources. And these are plasma FIVs. And in the case where we now have maybe uh, 30 uh, nanoamp beam, they're up to two or three microamps and a sputtering rate, which is more than 100 times faster. You know, in terms of different sources, yes, they're used. People also do ion implantation. And in that case, they'll have a multi-element source, and they'll use a mass spectrometer to, uh, to filter and implant, for example, um, silicon into a material. And people make discrete devices, which are rad hard, is one of the applications by doing that. But most of what you're going to see are be the gallium sources. People have tried meta sources like cesium and never really gotten much luck with them. Gold is also a source and bismuth is also a source and you'll see them used on instruments such as the time of flight mass spec. Okay. Uh, Fred, someone asked about where the redep is on this image. Um, so these it, images were is, all created this by. This is all uh, read up. Yeah. So That's this is a, a cleaning cross section. That's so what all happens read up. is you start at the bottom, and the the uh, ion beam travels in a linear direction straight up, and it actually uh, digs a little bit deeper towards the end there. So what happens is since you don't have that constant uh, beam overlapping on the on the pattern, uh, as the beam moves forward, the material that we're removing has to go somewhere. Some of it gets carried off by the vacuum system. Some of it will deposit on the uh, instrument itself, but a lot of it will actually just redeposit right back. So that's the clean crossing, the, um, the image on the right. I went back to that earlier slide and it's interesting to note. So you see the read up here. You can actually see the read up position. So this is a case where we made this cross sectional analysis, but then cross-section the cross-section to enable us to see what was going on. And it's interesting to see just how much read-up is there. But you will find for some materials, it works out better to do this way versus that. One size, again, does not fit all. Uh, Fred, another question. Uh, when milling samples that have multiple phases, like a hard and a soft phase, are there some ways to overcome the different milling rates between the two phases to achieve a flat surface? You know, I'm not sure if I understand all that. Are these layers? Uh, it seems, well, he says there's two phases. Um. Okay, so if it's an area where there are two, all right, so there are two different things to consider. One is layers. Oh, it of says uh, bismuth phase metal. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, it says biphase metal. All right. So, um, I'll, I'll mention two different aspects. One is that we have different layers as you're sputtering through them, because you're doing these and slicing through them with a cross section, then you can directly um, remove material, even though they have different sputtering rates, it doesn't matter that much. Now let's imagine the case where you have two materials that don't sputter the same rate next to each other, and you wanna look at that interface. By putting the deposition of the metal on the top, at the point where you're doing this analysis, so if you look at what's here, if I had one material here and the other material here, by putting this on top, we tend to reduce that effect. Otherwise, indeed, you would see the one material that's better faster, this would be deeper here, and the other one not nearly as deep here. And that's why we, one of the many reasons why we deposit something on the surface, which is even if there's some non-uniformities here, it's not conformal and it will make something that's very uniform at the top. And it's a platinum or tungsten material and it doesn't sputter away that quickly. That enables you to get a good shot at doing what you want on materials that don't sputter evenly. 